He is risen. He is risen indeed. indeed. Amen. Well, again, we want to welcome everyone here. If you are a guest, I'd love to have the chance to meet you after the service. I'll be down the hallway in the Resource Center. So please make plans to stay a few minutes to uh, introduce yourself. At this time, I want to open in prayer to prepare hearts for the word. Father, we thank you so much that we can celebrate life. It, it's very just fascinating to think about winter and then spring, how death gives way to new life. And right now we celebrate the fact that Jesus rose and that it can be a new spring inside of our souls, that we can have this new life because of Christ. So Lord, we pray your blessing on your word, bless each person here. And God, if there's one here that does not know Jesus as Savior, I pray that today would be the day that they experience new life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. How many of you remember being afraid of the dark as a child? Is anybody else that way? Yes. You're afraid of that which goes bump in the night. And as a child, you're afraid of the dark and you're like, you know, you kind of eventually grow up and get over it. And some of you actually like the darkness. How many of you like to dim your houses? Some of you that have offices, it's dim all the time. And I walk into a certain office and I don't know whether to have a conversation or take a nap. It's so dark, right? And it's fun to dim lights and have different atmospheres and that's fine. But it's different with spiritual light and spiritual darkness. And we live in a world that is surrounded by darkness. You don't have to look at the news too long to see how dark our world is. And today I want to bring a message of hope. This is Easter. Jesus is risen, so it's a message of hope. And what I want to do is encourage you to think about the difference between the darkness and the light. To think about the difference between death and life. So today we're going to be in John chapter 20, so go ahead and turn there. Again, greetings to everyone watching online. We're so glad you're with us today. In John 20, we find what happens on that first Easter Sunday. Jesus on Friday was nailed to the cross. On Saturday, it was a Jewish Sabbath, so Jesus rested in the tomb because his work was finished. And now we find that first Easter Sunday. And it starts in John 20, verse 1. Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still what? Still dark. And saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple, and they were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there. And the handkerchief that had been placed around his head not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also. He saw and believed. May God bless his word. So today on this Easter Sunday, I want to give you three radiant truths, three truths that are sure to lead you out of darkness and into light. The first one is this, that whenever you're in darkness, you are missing out on life. So go back to verse 1 and 2. You have Mary Magdalene. She's sitting there. She comes to the tomb, and she sees that the tomb's open. Jesus is not there, and she doesn't yet remember the scriptures. Mary Magdalene is in the dark right now. She just doesn't know. And have you ever noticed the same is true with you and me when we're in the darkness what Mary Magdalene was experiencing that day, we often experience. A few thoughts about that. If, you, if you're living in the darkness, you have nothing of significance to live for. I mean, what's the purpose in life, right? Jesus, they think, is dead. What is the purpose? Your perspective on life is very cloudy. Whenever you're in darkness, you don't have much perspective. It's, it's cloudy, it's foggy, just like Mary going to that tomb that first Easter morning. 
life beyond the grave seems dark and meaningless. What lies beyond the grave? If Jesus is dead, if he's still in that tomb, what does that mean for me? And your heart is torn to pieces every time something bad happens to you. For the disciples, the one they loved was crucified and laid in the tomb. What's the purpose? What's the use? If Jesus is dead, what use do I have to go on to live another day? Have you ever been there? What's the use of life? What's the purpose of life? You live in doubt instead of destiny. And whenever you're walking in the dark, you're going somewhere, but you don't know where. You're tripping, but you don't know what you're tripping over. Darkness, darkness, darkness. You're running hard and fast, but you're going nowhere. And when you end up somewhere, you don't really know how you got there or where you're at. That was the story of Mary. That was the story of Mary Magdalene. She was running, she comes to the tomb, and it's like, where is Jesus? Darkness is not something fun to be stuck in. You can't seem to find your way out. So who is gonna rescue you from the darkness that you're in? Who is the one that will turn on the light? If you're here today and you don't have a thriving relationship with God, I just wanna make this statement. You're not here by coincidence, but you're here by providence. That maybe a friend invited you, maybe a relative, maybe a neighbor, but God has you here because he wants all of us to go from darkness into light. The second radiant Easter truth we have as we, as we come to this empty tomb is darkness was robbed of its power when Jesus defeated death. There's a story of a three-year-old boy. He went to go see his aunt, and he was in a side room, and it began to be very dark in the house, and he began to yell out, Auntie, I'm scared. I, I can't see you. Please come here. And the aunt said, If I come there, it won't help because you can't see me. And the little three-year-old boy said, yes, but whenever you speak, it gets light. And the thing about the little boy, he wasn't scared of the dark. He was scared of being alone in the dark. Isn't it good to know that no matter what darkness you go through, it's the presence of God that's with you? So today, some of you came with heartbreak. Some of you this year got the bad medical report that it's cancer. Some of you got fired from your job this year. Some of you went through a divorce and you thought that you would never get to the other side. Some of you had a death of a loved one, of a spouse, of a close friend. And right now it seems to be darkness. But when you look at verses three through eight, Peter and John come running to the tomb. Look back at the scripture. They come running into the tomb. And all of a sudden, John arrives at the tomb first. And what does he see? He sees that there's darkness, right? The sun is beginning to rise. He doesn't go in yet. And if he peeks in a little, he can see that there's grave clothes there, but Jesus is not there, but he waits. And I I wanna give you this picture of death throughout centuries, from the time of Adam and Eve after the fall on to the present time when Jesus was there, people saw death as a dark hole. And you would see footprints leading up to that dark hole. They would be buried, but there would be no footprints on the other side. But what happened that first Easter Sunday is Jesus lived 33 and a half years footprints. He went into this dark hole called the tomb, but on the third day there were footprints on the other side because Jesus is risen. And here's the thing about Jesus changing human history. When you look at the resurrection Jesus killed death. So if you are a true follower of Jesus, you don't have to fear death because Jesus killed death. Jesus robbed the grave. Something Jesus' enemies were afraid of, that grave robbers would come and they would steal the body of Jesus. But we see in this passage that Jesus' cloths are lying there and the cloth around his face was folded in a separate place. And that was a picture that no robbers robbed the grave. If they did rob the grave, they would have taken the body of Jesus and they would have taken the clothes and sold it on eBay a little bit later, right? Whatever the eBay was of that day. So no one robbed the grave, but Jesus robbed the grave. He killed death. He took the stinger out of sin. And from now on, we no longer have to fear death because Jesus defeated death. Can I get an amen? 
That's exciting news. So, from now on, when you look at death, you no longer have to fear it because Jesus stared death in the face and God the Father, through the power of the Holy Spirit, raised him from the grave. So, a group of us went to Israel a few months ago and we went and saw the garden tomb. And here's some pictures. This was the, the place, Gethsemane, that we think that looks like a skull, if you'll see that. And then the garden tomb is one of the places where they think most likely is one of the places where they think Jesus was buried. There's two potential sites, and both of them, there's nobody there. So we went in there, and we got to explore this garden tomb. And this is the place, if, if this was the place that they think it is, that Jesus' body was laid there. When the disciples came in that day, you saw his grave clothes lying there and the, the cloth wrapped around his face was folded. And the, the idea was Jesus took time to get out of the grave clothes, to fold the, 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 the cloth around his face so that when the disciples came in, they could realize that Jesus defeated death, that Jesus defeated the grave. So friends, you can search throughout Israel and you will not find the bones of Jesus because guess what? He is alive. Happy Easter Sunday. But you notice the disciples initially did not believe. You skip down to verse eight. John does believe after he sees. Mary's confused, right? Peter doesn't, he, he's, he's acting impulsively. He's running and going in and it doesn't say he believes yet, right? So why did the disciples, except for John, we see, immediately believe? Because didn't Jesus predict that he was going to die, be buried, and the third day he would rise again? So why did they not believe? Maybe stress. How would, how would you respond if someone that you love so much has just been brutalized and nailed to a cross? All of us experience stress, kind of like this lady you're going to see on the screen. You ever been there? Stress. How many of you have had stress this week? I want you to write this down on your listening guide. Whenever your emotions runs high, your intelligence runs low. Whenever your emotions runs high, your intelligence runs low. So the disciples are so stressed, all right? They're just like, what's going on? And sometimes you want to hear no evil, see no evil, and speak no evil. Like, well, what's going on? My life is so stressed. I'm just a ball of stress. How many cat owners do we have in the room? Okay, you're gonna love this next picture. Some of you feel like this. When you're trying to have a good day, you've had a rough day, you're trying to stay positive, it's great, I'm great, everything's just great, but it's not great. So why do the disciples not believe initially? There's many factors, but one thing is they were in the middle of a very stressful time in their life. And I just wanna speak hope to someone that's in a stressful time. Jesus knows what you're going through. He feels the pain that you experience. The psalmist says that you record all my tears, that you store them in your bottle. So right now, if you've been hoping for a breakthrough, but all you've had is breakdowns. Right now, if you've been hoping for life to get better, but it's just got worse. Right now, if you just want a little peace, but all you are experiencing is your life falling into pieces. I just want to give you this hope that because of the resurrection, you can go from darkness to light. You can go from despair to hope. So let's look at the characters around the tomb that day. We're still in verses three through eight. Notice Mary Magdalene. What is significant about Mary Magdalene? She's there, she's at the tomb. Something about Mary, and you can look at your listening guide, read that later, is that Jesus had rescued this drama queen. How do we know she was a drama queen? The Bible says that she had seven demons inside of her. That's, that's, that's a lot of drama, real drama. This, you know, if someone's demon possessed, they don't act normal, they act crazy, you don't want to be around them. But whenever she met Jesus, Jesus delivered her. And the Bible says that whoever is forgiven much loves much. So something I want you to write this down if you're taking notes. Mary was the last at the cross and she was the first at the tomb the last at the cross and first at the tomb. She was there, and she was there, the Bible says, with another Mary. There were some other women that came. If you read the parallel gospels, but she was there, and she was there to show her love for Jesus. And who does Jesus commission to tell the good news? Mary. 
So women, we got at least half here are women. If you've ever asked, can God use a woman? Can God use me? The first one commissioned to be a herald of the resurrection was who? It was a woman, right? It was a woman. So God used this woman that had a shady past but had devoted her life to spread the gospel. So here's an application you can take. It doesn't matter what you've done in the past. It doesn't matter how far you've run from God. It doesn't matter how disconnected you've been from the local church. If you come running to Jesus, he has his arms wide open for you. And not only does he want to rescue, deliver, and forgive your sins, but he wants to give you purpose and hope. Amen. And then we have Peter and John. Peter is a little older than John, so that's why some scholars say that's why John could outrun him to the tomb because he was a little older at this point in his life than John. John was still younger. And so John gets to the tomb. He looks in. He doesn't yet go in, but Peter, being the bold person that he is, he runs right in. He looks at the tomb, and he sees that Jesus is not there, that Jesus is risen. And because of that, I want to give you the third radiant Easter truth. Because of Easter, you can go from darkness to light, how this forever changes you. So we don't have time today, but when you get home, read the rest of John 20. We just read the first eight verses. What you'll see in John 20 is that the disciples are huddled together later that evening in a room. The door is locked because they're afraid of the Jews. If they kill Jesus, they may kill us, right? They're fearful. And all of a sudden, Jesus shows up in the room. And he shows them, they see his hands and his feet. They see the scars. One person is absent during his time. Does anybody know who that is? Thomas. So Jesus shows up at something like a week later, eight days later, and he, he, he shows up to Thomas. So we see two different scenes in John 20. But what I want to do is just summarize the rest of this chapter for you. And these are applications for you that if you know Jesus, if he's brought you from darkness into light, these are truths. The first thing is you can truly know peace. In verse 21, Jesus shows up in this room and he says, peace to you. Now, a little side note, and this is just a fun side note. Isn't it cool that Jesus in his resurrected body can like walk through walls? He can show up and he can disappear. And Jesus tells us that when we read scripture, we're gonna have a body like his. So we don't fully know what that's like, but if it's comparable to this, your new body is gonna be able to walk through walls and show up. I don't know this. This is what I call sanctified speculation, but I have a high probability that you can travel at the speed of thought when you get to heaven. Wouldn't that be cool? Jesus shows up and he, and by the way, you can eat in your new body. I mean, it's just like, so when you finally get that resurrected, glorified body, it's gonna be like Jesus. So he says, peace to you. And then in verses 21 and 23, we see that you can have a life of immense purpose. Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. So think about the irony. These are disciples that are doubtful. They're locked up in a room. They just heard a report that Jesus is alive. So Jesus has to show them himself, hey, I am alive, right? Mary is telling the truth, I'm alive. And whenever you feel like because you're doubtful, God can't use you, Jesus speaks destiny in the midst of your doubt. When you feel like, you, I can't serve God because I don't have it all figured out, I don't have my ABCs lined up, I don't really have systematic theology down, think about these disciples. They were doubtful, they were in a room, the doors were locked, they were fearful, and Jesus said, as the Father sent me, and what did the Father send him to do? He lived, and he died, and he rose, He's saying, listen, I'm sending you with this great commission call. So he speaks destiny even in the midst of their doubt. If you know Jesus, you can now have God's presence living within you. Notice in verse 22, he breathed on them. Go ahead and take a deep breath, everyone. Breathe out. He breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Something I came across recently from another pastor that really hit me is he was talking about the Ark of the Covenant, the Old Testament. The Old Testament Ark of the Covenant was where, like, the presence of God. It symbolized the presence of God. And the Ark of the Covenant had two angels that kind of had their wings spread out and covered the Ark. If you read in John 20, 
and you see the empty tomb, how many angels show up? You have two angels that show up and you're like, what is this? In the old covenant, the Ark of Covenant symbolized God's presence. But in the new covenant, the New Testament, you see this tomb that had the presence, the very person of Jesus, and now he's gone. Where is the presence of God? The presence of God is now in every believer. God can no longer be contained by a building or an ark. Now the two angels show up, and to me this symbolizes that, guess what? You carry the presence of God in you and with you if you're a believer. It's not just, that's just mind-boggling. Like the tomb is empty, so I can be full of God's presence. Soak that in a little bit, the presence of God. If you know Jesus, you're truly blessed. So fast forward about eight days later, whenever it's like a week or so later, I think the Bible says eight days if I remember, all of a sudden Thomas is there. And Thomas says, I will not believe unless I see the scars in his hands and his side and so forth. And Jesus says, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not yet seen and yet have believed. So if you're here today, and you truly have placed your faith in Christ. In other words, you said, Jesus, I believe, I place my faith in you. You've been born again. You've asked for forgiveness. You've accepted Christ. Jesus says that you are blessed because Thomas saw. And a lot of times we say seeing is believing, right? But faith is believing is seeing. You believe before you see. So if you have believed in Jesus whom you have not yet seen with your eyes, Jesus says you're blessed. You've gone from darkness to light and you are blessed. Another promise from this passage, we fast forward to verses 30 and 31 of John 20. If you know Jesus, you are truly alive. If you'll notice in verse 30, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. I came to herald to you the greatest news of all time. Jesus is alive. And because he's alive, you can too be alive. The tomb is empty so you can life can be full. The tomb is empty so your life can be filled with God's presence. Jesus is living. And if you're in Christ, you are living too. Amen. Amen. So it brings the question on Easter Sunday, what does it mean to truly follow Jesus? What does it mean to truly believe? Don't a lot of people believe in God? Yes, a lot of people believe in God. The Bible says in the book of James, even the devil and the demons, they believe and they shudder, but there's no saved devil out there. So what does it mean to be saved, to be born again, to be a Christian? Well, I wanna present to you the gospel in the most simple form that a child can understand it. It's the ABCs of salvation. The A stands for you have to acknowledge your need for Jesus. Like, until you realize that you're a sinner, you have no need for a Savior that you're aware of, right? So the Bible says in Romans 3.23 that all of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. I once talked to an older gentleman, I think he was a doctor, and he said, I have never sinned. And I'm like, what do you mean? And for him, he meant I've never murdered, I've never committed adultery, I've never done the big, big nasty sins. And I said, well, have you ever lied before? Well, yeah, that's a sin. Have you ever had a bad thought that you dwelled on? Well, that's a sin. To be a sin, to, to be a sinner does not mean you're as bad as you could be. It means that you've missed the mark of God's glory. You've messed up. And until you are willing to acknowledge that, you can never be saved. You can never accept a savior until you first realize your need for a savior. So you acknowledge that Jesus is a savior, I'm a sinner. That's the A, acknowledge. B is believe. Someone say believe. When we use the word gospel, we have to define because gospel is used so much in the South that it kind of runs together. We have gospel music. We have that's the gospel truth. But what is the gospel? When we say gospel, we're talking about Jesus' perfect life. We're talking about the cross where he died sacrificially, atonement in your place and for you. He, He died the death that you deserve because of your sin. And then we're talking about the resurrection, Easter Sunday. So the gospel is the perfect life, the sacrificial death, and the bodily resurrection of Jesus. That's the gospel. 
And the gospel is this, that if you believe it, that Jesus died, Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if you believe in your heart that Christ died and God raised him from the dead, it says you will be saved. It says with the heart, man believes, and with the mouth, confession is made to salvation. So that brings us to the C. So you acknowledge, someone say acknowledge. You believe, and then confess. What is confess? Well, if something is true from within, it's going to come out of your mouth. How many of you are foodies? You love certain restaurants. There's a lot of foodies out there. And when you find a good restaurant, what do you do? You tell everybody about it, right? Well, if Jesus has made a change in your life, it's just going to come out. You're going to share about it. You become a herald of the gospel. Just like some of you are like, man, I love this certain restaurant, or this sports team. You proclaim it. That's what it means. The confession comes out. So that's the ABCs of salvation. And after you make the decision, what this looks like, it's no magical prayer, but Romans 10, 13 says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What does it mean to call upon the name of the Lord? Well, it's, it's telling God that you believe that Jesus died for you, rose again, and you receive it. See, where a lot of people get the gospel wrong is they think, well, I've always been a Christian. Well, I haven't always been married. Was it 13 years now, Lori, almost 14? I had to make a decision. You know, a lot of people say, well, I've always been a Christian. Here, here's something truth I want to give you. God has no grandchildren. He just has children. Just because your mom or dad were Christians doesn't make you one. It's just like when you get married, I'm, I'm, I had a commitment in my heart to Lori, but until I went public and said, I do, that's when it became official. A lot of people have God in their head that like, they believe, but they never have received it. It's like a present, like God gives you a present, but until you open it up and like, okay, I'm gonna use it, that's when it becomes yours. So when it comes to salvation, it's not talking about a head knowledge that you believe there's a God, it's talking about a lifelong pursuit. That because I say I do, I'm not just, just receiving salvation, it begins with that, but this commitment changes my life. And I think in American culture, a lot of people think of salvation as easy believism. You just believe a certain thing and you live like you want, but that's not the gospel. The gospel is I receive it by grace alone, not by works, but because I receive it, my life changes. I go from darkness into light. The call to follow Jesus is the call to discipleship. It starts with the prayer, but it should never end with the prayer, amen? So let's be clear. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, but true faith is never alone. Once you ask Jesus to save you, your life changes. Picture it like this. If someone as big as God moves on the inside and your life doesn't change, you gotta ask your question, did, did God really move inside my life? When God moves inside of your life, everything changes. You go from darkness into light. You go from death to life. So here's the thing. If you believe this easy believism gospel that you just, yeah, I believe and your life doesn't change, you have to check back up because the Bible says it's so radical, it's like a birth of a new baby. There's a new birth. It's like a metamorphosis that happens. You go from being a caterpillar to being a butterfly. If you've never experienced that, I encourage you to check back because if God moves in, guess what? The light comes on. You go from death to life. And Colossians says it like this. What happens when a person is born again? Paul summarizes the gospel like this. You were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. So in other words, you live by just the old nature. That was your old life. And then God made you what? Alive with Christ. For he forgave all of our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. So here's the picture, that whenever a person truly is born again, what happens? God takes all of your sins, past, present, and future. How do I know future? Because when Jesus died on the cross, you weren't even here. You were future. So whenever you receive what Jesus did, he takes every sin that anyone would ever commit, all those who receive forgiveness, guess what where it's, the sin is? It's nailed to his cross. So even though you weren't yet born, when Jesus died for you that Good Friday, he knew that you would receive him for all of us who have. He knew, God has a foreknowledge, we all know that. And what happened when he said it's finished, he said, I've paid for everyone's sin. But that, that payment is only received when you receive Christ. It's possible for anyone to be saved. He died for the world, 
but it's only made applicable if you receive it. Just like a gift has to be unwrapped, only when you receive Christ is that applied to your account. So let's look under your seat. There's something you'll find there. You're like, where is he going with this? For those of you who have ADHD, we always have to have illustration, just kidding. Um, we have to have illustration. So this is a glow stick, don't break it yet. We're gonna pray in a moment, and then I'm gonna give you a chance to break it. But something this glow stick is gonna illustrate is today's big idea. Let's put the big idea on the screen. Following Jesus leads you from what? From darkness into light. Mary Magdalene went to the tomb that first Easter Sunday while it was dark. But when the light started to rise, they saw something in the tomb. Someone was missing. Who was missing? And Jesus later up sh shows up the afternoon, read John 20, and he says, I'm alive. Eight days later, I believe it is, a week later or so, he shows up to Thomas, I'm alive. And what happens is when you accept Jesus, you go from not just literal darkness, but spiritual darkness into spiritual light. You go from death to life. So in just a moment, we're gonna have some action steps. We're gonna pray, but let, let's talk to the seeker today. The person that's not yet sure, you came here today, you, have, yet you know the gospel, but you haven't really received it. It's kind of like you thought God has grandchildren, but he doesn't, he only has children. And how do you become a child? You have to be born into the family. God has only one eternal legitimate son, and that's Christ. The rest of us are adopted into the family. So here's, here's the response for the seeker, it's the invitation to receive the good news, to get the best gift of a lifetime, a relationship with God, first and foremost, and that results in everlasting life. And you begin to walk in the light. All right, for the person that we would consider the CEO, you're like, what is the CEO? For those of you who have the ple pleasure of only seeing on Christmas and Easter only, I miss you throughout the year. I, really, I, miss, I miss seeing you. I love seeing you on Christmas and Easter. But here's the thing. If Jesus is so alive, and he is, shouldn't that affect your daily life? Shouldn't that affect your devotion to the church? Because if he's alive, we have a mandate to go tell the good news, to go out and share. And Christ was committed to us so he wants us to be committed to him. So for the CEO, I love you so much. I wanna see you more than just Christmas and Easter. If, if I don't see you again till Christmas, I'll miss you. But it's more than that, God wants to use you. So the call is to surrender all of you to him. Jesus gave his whole life. Have you given your whole life to him? And then for the rest of us, today's a day of celebration. Whenever we close, and we're gonna have you out way before 12, and everyone said, Amen. That's why we do 1030 service. We're going to have you out way before. So here's the thing. Celebrate. As you eat the Easter lunch and Easter dinner, you're eating to say, I celebrate Jesus is alive. I celebrate the tomb is empty. Because the tomb is empty, my life no longer has to be. So let's pray together.